praise God, praise God. Amen, amen. We are so glad to be in the house of God one more time. I just need to have a witness this morning that you're glad that God woke you up and allowed you to see another day. How many know he didn't have to do it? Oh, but thank God he did. I've been through enough in my life to realize that all the blessings of God is worth giving him praise because truly he did not have to do it. You didn't do it for me. I didn't wake myself up this morning. I know I pushed the button on the alarm clock, but I know it was God that woke me up this morning. So we give him praise and we give him glory for being such a loving and caring God. Uh, just on a few announcements, I don't know how many of you attended the health fair on yesterday, but God truly blessed that health fair. We are so grateful for all the presenters who did such an excellent job uh, presenting, and we got a lot of good information uh, on yesterday. I've been beating my muscles and <laughs> rubbing my legs and stuff and all this stuff, and I'm feeling better even this morning. Amen. <laughs> I got to exercise with them a little bit. I couldn't go too long, you know what I mean? Uh, Y'all be rushing the brush to the hospital, but... But I was blessed on yesterday, and even one of our own members was a presenter as a uh, um, medic, and he did an excellent job. Minister Logan did an excellent job, and for that, we're grateful. We're so grateful for, for First Lady Williams and the women ministry and all of those who thought it not robbery to come out and support and to help. Uh, make that day a success. Amen? Amen. On a Saturday note, we are looking forward to uh, laying to rest uh, Sister Mary Hodge, a longtime member of this yes. church. Yes. Even before I came here, she was here, uh, but she also served as the nurse uh, for this pastor, yes. uh, serving me and protecting me and watching over me there in the pulpit. And she has served well, and her daughter has served well at this church. Uh, so the funeral will be on this Thursday at 11 o'clock. Uh, we will have viewing, but it's going to be a short viewing. We're going to go right into uh, the funeral. Uh, we're asking for 100 people to be there. I know I don't typically do that, uh, but we are kind of lifting the band a little bit. And because of who she is and because of her longtime service, I think it was appropriate. Uh, on that behalf. Amen? Amen? So let's keep that family in prayer as they deal with the loss of their mother. Also, we're looking forward to celebrating our graduates of our, of our church. Amen. 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 We have a few of them who are graduating. We want to make sure uh, that we get that information to um, Deaconess McClendon, uh, that she will be able to make sure that we get all that information, uh, that we can acknowledge them and celebrate them. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay, starting on the second Sunday, on next Sunday, uh, next Sunday I'm going to lift the band a little bit. I'm sorry? No, next Sunday. On next Sunday, uh, I'm going to lift the band a little bit. Uh, we've been asking only people who have been vaccinated uh, to come, but starting on next Sunday, you don't have to be vaccinated. Now, I still will be insisting that you wear your mask uh, and that we safely distance. Amen? Amen. 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 But I just want to see some more faces Amen. in the house of God. Amen. So starting on next Sunday, uh, we will lift the band and we're going to go to 75 people uh, starting on next Sunday. Amen? Amen. 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 Uh, you still have to register uh, and make sure we stay safely distanced and make sure we wear our mask. Amen. We want to uh, start adding more people, but we want to be safe. Amen. God tells us to use wisdom. Amen. Amen. And that's what I want to do. Uh, so we're going to start with opening him, lift him up. We're going to have scripture reading by Deaconess Muriel Jackson. And then we're going to have prayer by Reverend Jackson. And then we're going to have two selections from the praise and worship team. 
and then we're going to reason from the word of God. God bless you.
Lord God, we honor you, Lord God, in spirit and in truth, Lord God. And if there is any contentious spirits, Lord God, we ask that you remove it, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, Lord God. That, Lord God, somebody might be thinking, Lord God, instead of praising. Lord God, we just got to give it all to you, Lord God. We're all, Lord God, and at the altar, Lord God, looking for the blessing, Lord God, that is personal, Lord God. That someone might be going through something, Lord God, and someone needs a breakthrough. Someone might need a breakthrough immediately, Lord God. Someone may be sinking in, in sand, Lord God. So, Lord God, we honor you, Lord God, and we praise you, Lord God, through, Lord God, the storms and the rain, Lord God. And we thank you, Lord God, for giving us a life raft, Lord God, just when we thought we were drowning, Lord God. Lord God, you gave us another breath, and we owe it all to you, Lord God. And we just worship you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God. And we ask in the name of Jesus, Lord God, that you be in this service, Lord God. That those that are watching live stream, Lord God, and those that are present here today, Lord God, that will throw everything, all their baggage, all their weight onto the altar, Lord God, so that we can all live in free will just to give you the praise and give you the glory in which you deserve. Lord God, we ask, Lord God, that the word that is spoken, Lord God, breaks chains, Lord God. Lord God, we ask that you use the man, Lord God, that's going to bring forth the bread of life, Lord God. Use him in a mighty way, Lord God. That, Lord God, it will be a sweet aroma to your nostrils. So, Lord God, help us, Lord God, with our worship. Lord God, we can't worship you the way you want to be worshipped without you. Lord God, we welcome you, Lord God, into this place, Lord God. That, Lord God, that you can do miraculous things, Lord God, with the smallest, Lord God, of faith. So, Lord God, mend all our faiths together and give you the glory and give you the honor in which you richly deserve, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God, for being with us, Lord God. Thank you for working through us, Lord God. That, Lord God, we can be an example to this dying world. Use us for your glory. Thank you, Lord God for all that you've done for us, Lord God. Big and small, thank you. We honor you. We give you all the praise and all the glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hallelujah. Bless his name, for the Lord is good and his mercy is everlasting. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah, forever, we worship you, ourselves before you, we're going to give you the glory, come on, one more time, glory, 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 hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah. Forever, thank you. You're the first and the last. We worship and we bow to your majesty. Hallelujah. It's due. Come on, saints of God, we magnify. We glorify your name. And we shout with anticipation. Hallelujah, there's power in that name, Jesus. We magnify. We glorify your name, Father God. We lift you and we exalt you, hallelujah. We shout, oh God, with anticipation. We know you're going to come through. We magnify. We glorify. We glorify. We glorify. We glorify. We glorify. We magnify. We magnify. Hallelujah. There's nothing. Jesus, hallelujah. 
Jesus. Hallelujah. It's saying, for the Lord is good. We magnify. We magnify. We exalt your name.
God, praise God. How many know this exactly what he's looking for? He wants you to praise him with your whole heart. Not part of your heart, not, not some of your heart, but your whole heart. to give my Savior, my Deliverer, not some of my heart, but my whole heart. You want to put a smile on Jesus' face, give him your whole heart. You want to see him do some miraculous things in your life. Give God your whole heart. So we give God praise. It's the miraculous God that he is. But didn't have to do it, but he did, God. And we give him praise. And we give him the glory. I, I like seeing my God smile when I give him my whole heart. We're going to talk about that a little bit. Because he's a God who is deserving of everything that you have. Not a little bit of it. Not an occasional moment. But your whole heart. Excuse me for my tears. But when I think on the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, I just can't hold back sometimes. It, it gets the best of me. And I, and um, I don't know about you, I don't think I may have arrived yet. I want a pause mentality. With that said, we're going to read uh, Acts chapter 20, verses 18 through 24. Acts chapter 20, verses 18 through 24. I'm reading from the New King James Version. And it reads, when they had come to him, he said to them, you know from the first day that I came to Asia, in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, many tears and trials, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews, how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and house to house, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And see now, I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem. Listen, not knowing the things 
that will happen to me there. Except the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, not just one city, but every city saying that chains and tribulation awaits me. This is the challenge. But none of these things move me. Nor do I count my life dear to myself so that I may finish the race with joy in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. <laughs> what an amazing testimony. I want to talk from the thought an overcoming faith. An overcoming faith. But first, there needs to be a question asked of each professing Christian. I say professing Christian because just because we come to church doesn't always guarantee your salvation. And let me burst the bubble. Just because you've been baptized does not mean that you are saved. The only way you get saved is because you made a personal decision to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. So I've got to ask a question before I get really started here. Um, are you really a Christian? That's, that's a personal question. Don't turn to your neighbor. Don't, don't turn to your neighbor and ask them, well, are you really a Christian? No, no, this is your, this question is for you. This question is for me. It's a personal question. Are you really a Christian? Because if this message, if you're not really a Christian, this message is not for you. This is only for real Christians. You can't expect God to help you if you don't know him. And the title of this message is An Overcoming Faith. An overcoming faith is truly needed in these times. Please don't assume that everything is going back, just because things might be going back to normal, that everything is going to be fine. Don't assume that because they've lifted some restrictions, that everything's going to be fine. In the midst of all that we have gone through and all that we will face in life, you need more than just saying, I got this. You need an overcoming faith. Let's ask this question of a committed Christian. What do you think God desires of us? Just throwing it out there. What do you think God wants from you? God wants your heart. Every hour of the day, every day of the week, every week of the year, God wants your heart. We just sang it, didn't we? Your whole heart. More than anything, God wants you. He wants an intimate relationship with you. He, he wants loyalty from you. He he wants faithfulness from you. He, he wants trust and intimacy from you. Trust. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge your TV characters. No, that's not what he said, is it? That's, that's not what he said. He, he didn't even say acknowledge your girlfriend. He didn't even say acknowledge your wife or your husband. 
It says acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. He wants intimacy as a deer pants for the water brook. So pants my soul for the Lord. When is the devotion? Where is your devotion? Where is your commitment? We live in an uncommitted time. What happened? What, what made our commitment level go foul? And, and let, me, let me say something. Don't think that just because we're in a pandemic that people are more committed now. There are some who have drifted further away from God during the pandemic. I'm going to get under that a little bit too. I'm afraid many are called themselves has become complacent. Comfortable to the point where they take God for granted. In times when, when, when this Bible was written, Christians were dying for their faith. They were giving their lives for their faith. Now we can't even come to church faithfully. Okay, I know. You, you said, no, but Pastor, we're on live stream. We can't even live stream faithfully. I'll look at it later. I, I think it's coming on Facebook or YouTube. Okay, I'll check it out next week. I learned in the text that there are some characteristics that God wants us to have that Paul demonstrates in the text. First, Paul strive to live right. Doesn't mean you don't fall. But when you fall, you get back up. Anybody know that's good news too, right? Verse 18 says, when he had come to them, when they had come to him, he said to them, you know, from the day that I came to Asia, what manner I lived among you. He lived right before the people. How we live matters. How you carry your life matters. Bad lifestyle Christians. Oftentimes, they're mean on their job. I uh, served as computers throughout the Philadelphia School District for 14 years. And one of the places, of course, I had to go was to the secretary's office when I came into the school. And I have saw this one sister. I'm glad I don't know her name because I ain't calling it out. I remember this one sister. She had a Bible on her desk. And she was the most unlike person in the place. Because she was a nasty person. She was a mean person. She always thought she was better. Bad lifestyle Christians are mean at the job. They're oftentimes mean at home. They're mean at church. They're mean to their spouse. They're mean to their children. They're often nasty to their parents. Oftentimes, I'm not saying you got all of these things. I'm saying that you might carry a couple of them. A lot of times, they're envious. A lot of times, they're liars. A lot of times, I'm talking about a, a bad lifestyle Christians. They're gossipers. They party a lot. They don't read their Bible much. They party a lot, but they don't pray much or not at all. They curse a lot, too. I'm talking about bad lifestyle Christians. And, and let, me, let me ask the question. Why should anybody follow your God? Wow, Pastor. Just because you have Jesus signs up. while you're committing an insurrection of the capital doesn't make it right. Just because you support somebody like Donald Trump 
with a Jesus sign up doesn't make it right. Just because you support racism with a Jesus sign up does not make it right. The word said, let your light so shine before men. He, he's talking about a godly light. He's not talking about a flashlight, by the way. Because we all can buy a flashlight. But he's talking about a godly light. He says, let your light so shine before men that they might glorify the Father which is in heaven. We, we are to be the light of the earth. Paul's life was different after his conversion. How many know that I, 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 I struggle sometimes when someone say they accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior, but there's absolutely no change in your life? I'm sorry, I, I struggle with that only because I know the Savior. And I know that, I'm not saying that you're going to be perfect afterwards, but I'm saying there's got to be some form of change in your life when you come to know Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. I'm sorry, I don't think it's possible. Paul changed after his conversion. Matter of fact, the word tells me that he used to be a persecutor of the church. He used to take Christians to prison. But when God came into his life, he changed. Um, what, what is it about your life that would tell somebody you're saved? Wow. What is it about your life? No, don't you get, don't go there. I did not say you're perfect. Because you wouldn't need him to uh, forgive you anymore if you were perfect. How many know that we need to be forgiven almost every single day? Why? Because we sin what? And thought, word, and... I'm not counting your failures. I'm not talking about the things you've already been repented for. But are you kind? Can somebody tell you're saved? Are you kind? Are you loving? Are you gentle? Are you giving? Do you have joy in your spirit? Are you peaceful? Are you a faithful person? <laughs> Second thing about Paul is that Paul had humility. Humility is a strong sign of growth. A lot of times people take it the other way around. They think if you're too humble, that you're nearly not growing. Listen, you cannot sincerely pray. You cannot sincerely pray. You cannot sincerely read the word of God. You cannot sincerely listen to the word of God and stay prideful. You cannot genuinely read the word of God and it not humble your spirit. Can't do it. Because the word of God will humble you. Because the more you pray, the more you read, the more you listen to the word of God, the more you realize how messed up you are, the more it would humble you before God. The more you realize that but for the grace of God, I am what I am. The only reason I'm still standing today is because of the grace of God. The stuff I've done, the places I've been. The only reason I'm still here. The only reason you're still here is because of the grace of God. He didn't have to do it, but he did. Since I've known him, it has humbled me. By, by the way, God hates pride. He, he's got a serious problem with those who are prideful. Matter of fact, the word tells me he resists the pride. Proverbs 16 through 19. These six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. First thing he says is a prideful look. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? He hates pride. 
Matthew uh, 23, 12 puts it this way. Whoever exalts himself shall be abased. God ain't going to let you flex for so long. And then he's going to check you. But then Paul was a helpful Christian. He didn't just sit and look at work being done. He got involved. Paul was a helpful Christian. And for those of you, let me just say this. Um, for those of you that might want to shut me off at this moment. Just know God knows you're shutting me off too. He knows that you no longer want to hear the word of God. Where's my cell phone? Shouldn't I be on Facebook about now? God loves helpful people. He said, I kept back nothing from you that was helpful. The Christian life is a life of helping. If you're not a helping Christian, you're doing it wrong. If you don't get involved some way in some capacity in the house of God, let me bring it to you straight. The members of Baptist Temple, you know the vision. You've seen the things that we try to do in the house of God. If you don't show up for no event. Oh, brother. And not only are you doing it wrong, you haven't been listening. You were on live stream, but you haven't been listening. How many know that sometimes you can listen, but not, you can hear, but not actually listen? You do know that you can do that, right? That, that there's a lot of times when you're busy doing something else, you heard something, but you don't know what they said. I, I can't always uh, be thinking about, you can't always be thinking about yourself and be a good helper. You, you're not a genuine helper if, if, if the question you ask is what benefit do I get out of this? You, you, you're not a good helper if, if you're only going to do it if you get the glory. How often do you help others? I didn't say family. Because instinctively, we have a tendency to help our family. When my family get in trouble and they need money, I'll give them money. But what about that person that's not my family member? And I saw them in need, and I passed them up. Are you an encourager? Are you an edifier? I know this is a slow message, but you hang in there with me. Are, are you an edifier? That, that means that you build people up instead of tearing them down. Or is most of your conversation in the form of criticism, in the form of jabs, in the form of negativity, putting others down? Jane puts it this way. He says the tongue is damaging. He says the tongue is untamable. It's unruly. He says it's an evil, full of poison. That's what James says about the uncontrolled tongue. He says that tongue hurts people and it tears people down. Listen, once you say something, it's hard to take it back. Now, I'm not saying you can't take it back, but it takes longer for it to go back than it does for you to say it. Listen, how many know that the damaging of the words you say lingers well after you said you're sorry? I've, I've met some people with razor tongues right in the church. 
I've had to take some of my members down who were razor tongue right in the church. Can you imagine what it's like at home? Think about that now. If you be razor mouth to members of the church, can you imagine what it's like in that house? Or maybe on their job? If they can do it in the house of God, you can imagine what it's like in the house. Oh, I know I'm getting on somebody. Parents, we must be careful how we talk around our children. Because talking is a behavior. The way you talk becomes a behavior. And children have a tendency to follow how you behave more than what you say to them that is right. Do y'all get what I'm saying? You can say you should do this right but then they see your behavior and they're more likely to follow your behavior. Yeah. If you talk bad about people, your children are going to end up talking bad about people. If you curse a lot, just listen when they're in the bedroom on the phone, you'll find them cursing a lot. If you're disrespectful, you will find that your children will be disrespectful. How many know that verbal abuse can be almost as bad as physical abuse? How many know that you can heal from a scratch, but what you said lasts a lot longer than that verbal or that physical abuse? Wait a minute, then verse 21. Paul showed favoritism, or he didn't show favoritism. He testified to the Jews and to the Greeks. He wasn't just caught up because he was Jewish. So he wasn't just caught up with the Jews. He also testified to the Greeks. He, he wasn't just caught up with the white people. He cared about the black and people of color also. He didn't want to just make America great because we all know what that means. What it really means is make America white. Paul was a Jew, and Jews were known to be prejudiced. I don't know if y'all knew that or not. They, they were a little small. And the reason they were swole was because they were the children of Abraham. But if they had figured the whole thing out, they would have realized that God sent Abraham, built the nation of Jews, to bring the word of God to everybody. So when Jesus died on the cross, he didn't just die for the Jews. He died for you and he died for me. Paul didn't show favoritism. He said, I'm going to do good to all people, especially those of the household of God. You need to look out for your folk. Listen, if you can't treat your brother and sister right, how can you genuinely say you love the Lord? Because if you think he just died for you, I got news for you. He died for all of us. He died for the Latinas. He died for Asians. He died for white people. He died for black people. He died for all races. He died for the poor. He died for the rich. He died for the broken. He died for the homeless. He died for us all. Okay. But now Paul shows that he was steadfast unmovable. Verses 22 to 24. And see now, I'll go bound in the spirit. He was obedient. I'll go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, yet that the Holy Spirit, except that the Holy Spirit testifies 
in every city, saying that chains and tribulation awaits me. Wait a minute, wait a minute. But none of these things move me. Nor do I count my life dear to myself. Wait a minute, he's, got, he's doing it for a reason. That I may finish the race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of Jesus Christ or of the grace of God. Paul was not saying that he was a superhero. Don't, don't, don't think that that's what he was claiming. He wasn't claiming to be a super, superhero. He wasn't even claiming to not have emotions. He, he wasn't claiming that sometime he shed tears. Matter of fact, he says it in the text. He, he wasn't even claiming that, 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 that he doesn't grieve over a lost loved one. He, he wasn't even saying that he hates the fact that he gets sick sometimes. He wasn't saying that. He, he, he knew that sometimes sickness comes his way. And he knew that sometimes the doctor might shake his head. But he made up in his mind that he's going to still stay with the Lord no matter what. He said that in spite of all of these things, I ain't going nowhere. The downs, the disappointments. I ain't going nowhere. For God I live, and for God I die. I shall not be moved from my faith. God didn't stop being God simply because things didn't work out the way you wanted them to. Just because you thought you pushed a button and God was supposed to jump, he didn't stop being God. I, I cannot stress this point enough. Most of you know how I feel about my wife. I want you to know right now that if God was to take her from me, you're going to see one sad pastor. You're going to say one toe up. But if you think that I stopped believing in Jesus Christ because God took her from me, then you don't know your pastor at all because I ain't going nowhere. You know why? Because I'm wise enough to know that it was God that gave her to me. And if he chose to take her home, I'm going home to see her one day. You hear me? I ain't going nowhere. For God, I'll live. And for God, I'll die. The word teaches us to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding, in the word of God. Now, and I, I need you to understand when, when he says unmovable, he don't mean that you're going to stop loving him just because you walked over here. Yeah. Unmovable means that I'm still loving him in my heart. Yeah. With my whole heart, yeah. I'm going to love the Lord. In my trials, yeah. in the good times, when things mess up, when the doctor don't say what I want him to say, when I think my medication is not working, when I feel like everything is falling apart, I'm not going to be moved. I ain't going nowhere. Paul suffered a lot for the Lord. He was beaten. He, he was thrown in prison. He was falsely accused. He was rejected. He was stoned and left for dead. All for the sake of Christ. But he has a testimony. I'm not going. None of these things move me. I might move from one prison to the next prison. 
I may move a little bit when that stone hit me. But my heart did not move. I still love the Lord. We, never, we may never face this kind of suffering. But how many know that sometimes it gets rough? And God is calling you to stand. You, have to, you, you may have given up on me, but I ain't giving up on my Lord. The doctor may have shaken his head, but I ain't giving up on my Lord. I might even be at the point where I'm on the hospital bed, and everybody has said, there's nothing else we can do. I might get sad, but my heart has not changed. I still believe that God is the way, the truth, and the life. No one said the road would be easy. And though I'm, I'm, I'm going through some hard times in my life, I still trust the Lord. And I'm going to trust him until I die. Life gets hard sometimes. Do I have a witness in the house that knows that life gets hard sometimes? But none of these things, like Paul, will move me. And I'm going to stay faithful to the Lord. My mother might not go with me, but I'm going to keep on holding on. My father might not go with me, but I'm going to keep on holding on. Even the pastor might not go with me, but I'm going to keep on holding on to the Lord. My wife might not go with me, but I'm going to hold on to the Lord. For he is the way, the truth, and the life. You may talk about me, but I ain't going nowhere. You may criticize me, but I ain't going nowhere. I might even lose my job. But I ain't going nowhere. I might lose my spouse. I'm not going nowhere. I might get terribly sick, but I ain't going nowhere. I'm going to keep trusting in the Lord no matter what. None of these things move me. He brought me too far to turn around. Now, I know I asked it last week. How I many know there's a testimonies that we haven't shared with other people? Some stuff God has done, we haven't even told them because we don't want to tell them about the storm. But we know God brought us through that storm. He brought me through when I was about to lose my mind. He brought me through when depression struck me so bad. When I was hearing the pain of so many. And I had to absorb it all. God kept me in the midst of it all. I wish you were the only one that told me about it. I wish you were the only one storm that I had to hear about. But I got a testimony. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will feel no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. God kept me in the midst of it all. When it's time for me to go, I want to say like Paul. I fought a good fight. Listen, listen. And I kept the faith. No matter what life says. No matter what life brings. I want to be able to say like Paul. I've kept the faith. I wasn't perfect. I didn't cross every T or dot every I, but I kept the faith, and I finished the race because my mind was made up and my heart was fixed. I don't know about you, but my intention is to see Jesus, the son of the living God, the lily of the valley, the bright morning star. I want to see him for myself, the one who was my bridge over troubled waters, the one who was my umbrella 
in a time of rain. The one who gave me shelter in a time of storm. I want to see him. And one thing I'm glad of is that in spite of it all, he gave me an overcoming faith. No matter what you face, no matter what you go through, no matter how bad it is, God has given you an overcoming faith. But you must believe. I didn't say you must just come to church. I didn't say you must just show up on live stream. I said you must make a decision. A moment where you say, Lord, I want you in my life. Lord, I want you to be real in my life. I've heard pastor. I've heard him preaching. I've heard a lot of prayers. I've heard a lot of testimonies. But, Lord, I want you to be real in my life. Got good news. The word said, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For he or she who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Great love. Don't let anybody fool you. That was an incredible love that went to the cross. I don't, I don't know we realize how much, how much God God is. You know he could have started over with humanity. He did not have to tolerate all the sin and rejection that came from his creation. He did not have to give we talk about the Trinity and we talk about God. So actually when you speak of God, you're talking of three persons and one being. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Literally when he gave his son, he separated himself from himself. To die for you and for me. Now, you don't have to look at what everybody else has done. Just look at what you have done. And ask yourself the question. If you were God, would you have consistently taken that from you? Just be honest. Now I'm looking at the whole entire world. Generation after generation of rejection, sin, arrogance, pride. And instead of him starting over, he said, I love you so much. I'm going to separate myself from myself and take your place. You should have had the nails. The crown of thorns should have been on your head. You should have been whipped before going to the cross. But I did it because I love you. To the point of dying in your stead. Greater love has no man than this than to lay down his life for a friend. Let us pray. Father, we love you. We praise you. We magnify you. We glorify you for being our God and our keeper. You are an amazing God. And the more I learn about you, the more humble I become. The more I learn about you, the more I want to help others. 
The more I learn about you, I stop playing favoritism. The more I learn about you, the more I want to be determined to follow you with all of my heart and all of my life. So, Father, we thank you for all that you've done, all that you're doing, all that you will do. Father, we pray for Sister Hodges' family. We pray that you will bless them through this storm, Father. We, Father, we pray for all of our community, all those in our neighborhood, Father. We pray, Father, for the future mayor of this city, that you will give him everything he needs to be the man that will lead this city in the right direction. Father, we pray, Lord, for all the sick of our church, all those who are going through, all those who have lost loved ones, all those who are struggling with their children, struggling with their spouses. Father, all those who may have lost their jobs, all those who might be struggling with sicknesses, we ask that you'll bless in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we realize that we can't do anything without you, but we have this consolation. We can do all things through you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Let the church Amen. God has spoken. Let the church Let the church. 